right. So who is Eagle Technologies? Um, well, simply put, we're a, we're a data center integrator or expert. Uh, the way I like to put it is that we focus on the data. So how you present it to your users and your applications with appropriate performance, how you protect it, how you ensure good business continuity, disaster recovery, how you have good orchestration, how you understand what's in that data, how you protect it out on the edge. Uh, we like to help you make good decisions, decisions about when that goes out to live in the public cloud or when you might enable some software as a service and how you would back up that data. And then what we're going to talk about today, how you protect that data um, with solutions around managed risk and managed detection and response. That's what Eddie's going to talk about today. So the only other slide I have on Eagle uh, is just something I wanted to touch on. I think the reason that Eagle's been successful and been around for so long uh, is two things. Uh, a, they're owned by a bunch of nerds, right? That's never a bad thing. Three engineers have owned the company for 30 plus years. Um, but seriously, more importantly, we call it the Eagle way. We follow a process that is tried and true. That's what I've got up on the screen. So we always start by listening, trying to understand what problems the customer's trying to solve. Um, we then spend a lot of time understanding and educating uh, basically the state of the union, right? So what is the market doing? What solutions are out there? How are folks responding to tackle those problems and what kind of solutions tackle those problems? We then architect the solution um, and we take it really seriously with that we want the customer to understand the solution and be able to advocate it internally in their own company, right? If you actually choose Eagle, we go out and we deploy it. We do lots of training and knowledge transfer. We want you to feel comfortable. Um, I would argue we have the best support guys in the industry. We support the product after the sale, which makes us pretty unique in most cases. And I think that all of those different steps, steps help us succeed. And to be pretty candid, if you look at a lot of our competitors, some of these bullets are missing. And I think that's why we have high customer retention. I think that's why we have good business outcomes for our customers. Um, the only other thing I wanted to touch on before I hand it over to Eddie is just why uh, Eagle sees value in Arctic Wolf. I've done webinars like this before, and to distill down what I've talked about in the past, um, uh, Eddie and Arctic Wolf, they're really good at reducing the noise, helping you understand what you need to focus on to mitigate that risk, and then adding that personal touch with named security engineers. The thing I wanted to kind of touch on today before I hand it off is that here in the Midwest, I'm starting to see the hackers are getting even more aggressive and the frequency of attacks is increasing. Every week I hear a new customer story. Just last week I heard a new unsettling customer story, um, a customer that we worked with for a while, uh, someone that I would consider a friend. And he told me a story of how their company was disconnected from the internet for 30 days while a contracted incident response team that they paid six figures multiple times over um, spent 30 days removing a bad actor from their environment. Um, obviously that takes a big toll on the business, right, from a financial perspective. But what was interesting talking to uh, my customer and friend is that it also takes a, a pretty big personal toll, right? Uh, he, he was pretty candid that it had a physical impact because of the stress. He was kind of joking and candid that his girlfriend almost uh, walked away because in his words, he was being a jerk, right? And he kind of lived through this, this hell for 45 days, right, getting through it. Um, he was also worried about the professional impact it would have on him. Now, the happy ending is that he actually recently got a promotion because he's really good at what he does. But the point to all of that rambling is that hackers are evolving. They're increasing that frequency of attacks. And hopefully after you hear Eddie talk today, you'll see how Arctic Wolf is a critical part of your evolving security posture. I hope that makes sense. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Eddie. Eddie, I'm gonna stop sharing. All right, hold on a second. Insert Jeopardy theme music. <clears throat> There we go. I can see your screen. All right. I appreciate it. I'm uh, trying to get the slideshow started here. All right. Can you guys see the Eagle webinar with Arctic Wolf Networks? Uh, I can see it, sir. All right. So <clears throat> I appreciate the time today. Thanks, uh, Brian. And it's uh, the stories that you talk about, uh, <laughs> unfortunately, happen more times than not. I've talked to probably over a year now, I've been with Arctic Wolf. Um, I am the sales engineer with Arctic Wolf, and I've probably have heard 
about 200 to 300 of those types of stories. Um, and so it is something that uh, that's what we're, we'll be talking about today is kind of how can we help each other, but also give you some knowledge. Now, with that being started first, though, um, I wanted to make sure that you guys know uh, that Baby Yoda is a Chiefs fan. I didn't know if you guys knew this, uh, but uh, <laughs> Baby Yoda, uh, he loves my homies. <laughs> I like how they even use Hunts over Heinz because I think he's a sponsor for Hunts. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so, anyways. That's good attention to detail, Eddie. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what happens. He can use whatever he wants. He's the man. All right. So, the, what, the, what we'll be talking about today is really going to be uh, the you know, challenges, the SOC as a service, and also what I'd like to do is talk about one of our offerings, which is CIS benchmarking that comes with our managed risk and, um, and kind of why that's important. Now, when we think about fundamentally uh, why, um, why we do what we do and why everyone who's on this call is very interested in cybersecurity is because of this slide right here. The mean time to identify an attack is 230 days. The mean time to contain an attack is 84 days. Now, Fundamentally, when you start thinking about why we are buying products, why we're doing uh, buying firewalls and antivirus is to lower it down to as close to zero as possible. And in most cases, if you prevent it, it's at zero. But what happens is, is that there's just so much noise that is happening within the environment. And so it, it becomes very hard for companies to hire the analysts needed. Um, I'm going to assume that a lot of people on the call don't have, you know, eight to 12 cybersecurity analysts uh, working on staff monitoring it. Maybe you have one, maybe you have two, but if you think about it, it's almost like getting uh, ADT or Vivint uh, and only saying, well, I'm all, I only care if you monitor me from eight to five, right? I mean, that, that's not really the, the proper way of doing security. And unfortunately, what happens is, is that a lot of comp people start looking at well, let's just put products in there to monitor it. Well, when you start thinking about all the different products that happen, um, you start creating too much noise. Um, let's say seven, eight, nine years ago, most individuals had a firewall and let's say an antivirus. And if you think about it, that's just two dashboards. But let's say that all of a sudden you're in here and uh, you have, um, you know, a firewall, antivirus, you have a WAF, uh, you have, um, you know, a DNS like Umbrella, uh, you have an EDR vendor, uh, you have, um, you know, you're looking with like a stealth watch going side to side. The thing is, is, or maybe you're doing like a gigamon looking on NetFlow traffic east and west. The problem is, is that when you get all these simple dashboards, it becomes one complex problem. And so the problem is, is that it's just so much noise. If you think about it, what's interesting is, is that if you look at Marriott, you look at all the big boys, all of them have a SIM. All of them have analysts, but they still get compromised. Marriott was four years. And, and what happens is, is that a lot of people start trying to throw people only at the problem and not understanding that the real problem is, is the technology and the platform of how to identify threats quickly. And so as I look at some of the, um, the poll questions that you actually have, uh, one of the big things that I see is when you start looking at cybersecurity talent and why it's hard is that it's, it's so expensive to get the analysts. If you're thinking about what you guys have today, over half of you are saying that you have zero cybersecurity analysts that are certified and almost half of you have one to five which means honestly, everyone on the call is it's impossible to really do 24 by seven monitoring with eyes on glass, right? Because there's a thing called labor laws <laughs> that, uh, that come into effect. And if someone goes on vacation, things like that. And, and what Gartner says is that you need 12. I, I say you can get away with eight, but 12 is what Gartner recommends as the analyst. And so, you know, if I look at it here, nobody that's done the poll has actually said over six. So it makes it very hard uh, for individuals to do this. Now, what happens is, is that the cost of response time is, is very, very powerful, right? It, it's making sure 
um, is that we can actually understand that threat and contain it quickly. And so when we think about the evolution of security where most people are, uh, most individuals are going to be where um, they're going to be at depth and defense. So everyone on this call probably has endpoint protection. They have antivirus. They might have a next-gen firewall with an IPS, right, a Fortinet or, um, you know, Palo Alto or whatever. You have a next-gen firewall. Most everybody is going with those. If you don't have it, um, you're probably looking at getting it the next year or so. Uh, just because just so much attacks that are happening. But once you get all those products, it becomes who's there to actually monitor that they're doing what they say they're going to do. Um, the companies out there, Palo, Forty, uh, Cisco, none of them are really going to tell you, well, you just set it and forget it. You still have to tweak it. But how do you know when to do it if you don't have cybersecurity analysts on staff that can monitor it and understand the threats that are coming in 24-7? That's where we come in. We're with Arctic Wolf Networks, we're gonna be that detection and response and log correlation. So we're, we replace the SIM, we're bringing, and you don't have to like manage a SIM anymore because what I've found is when I talk to cybersecurity analysts, I ask them, do you love managing the SIM? Nobody's ever said, oh yeah, it's the greatest thing. I wake up every morning happy to, to manage a, a Splunk instance or an alien vault or whatever. I think the interesting part is, is that we do it a lot of times because you know, we need to be able to at least get that information for maybe compliance or uh, maybe there's some other tools that we're trying to use in conjunction with it. But when we think about it, um, where what people are missing a lot of times is host isolation, containment, uh, human intelligence that get brought into it. And that's what we're really trying to do. Our job is to really do the blue team type of activities to make sure that we understand what's going on within the environment and letting you be more proactive with like red team and things like that. And what's interesting as I start looking at some of the polls, you know, um, compliance is one of the biggest things. So almost over half of you actually have, actually mostly everyone here is starting to say that they have uh, compliance issues of some sort. It could be GDPR to HIPAA to PCI, but really making sure that to be truly compliant, you have to understand the environment because now a lot of those auditors are asking um, the question, prove me, prove to me that you actually are monitoring it and you're not just doing it as a checkbox, right? Uh, and, and that's where we've been uh, very valuable. Now, what happens a lot of times is that customers will buy a bunch of products and I've had conversations, I'd say maybe two or three out of 10 people tell me this, I already have all the products I need. Um, well, we're not a product, we're a service. <laughs> and so if you think about all the prevention tools that are out there, what can circumvent those tools, right? From phishing examples of making sure that's the number one type of attack vector that turns into something like ransomware, um, human error insider threat, right? We saw that within Capital One, uh, going in and uh, opening up a port, uh, opening up access to the internet. Also account takeover, right? Uh, you have a lot of people that are posting in their credentials. Right now, one of the biggest attacks that we've seen so far within the last 30 days, and actually I went to a conference that they talked about as well last week, was uh, the threats around uh, benefits. So around this time, everyone on this call is getting an email from their benefit company saying, hey, we're looking at changing benefits, make sure you register. And so they'll create benefits based on that, um, based on uh, the website looks close to what maybe you might use. And then you'll go in and you'll fill it out and then you have to create a username and password. Once you do that, they got your information. Because if, if you get an email saying, hey, just to let you know, we're changing the benefit provider. Here's kind of what we'll be doing. You're not used to that old, the new way of doing it. So you're just going to approve it and go, oh, I'm used to seeing it at this point in time. So just know that that's how like account takeover and easy it could be. That has sometimes nothing to do with some of your prevention tools because it could be outside of your environment. When we start thinking about unpatched vulnerabilities, a lot of individuals are not doing um, vulnerability scanning, right? And, and so when you start thinking about it, um, that's uh, fundamentally, you know, why you need a service to make sure you are monitoring um, the full uh, attack surface within your environment. Now, when we think about Arctic Wolf for a SOC as a service, uh, there's two service offerings that we offer to our customers. Um, and we're going to go at a high level and discuss them because uh, I want to get into uh, some of the uh, benchmarking. But there's two, if you look at the NIST framework, and NIST for the framework is what most people might use because it is, well, it's free 
and it's easily consumable, and it gives you an option uh, to, to understand what's going on. So when we look at this um, on the right side, man's detection response or MDR is fundamentally um, what Arctic Wolf is known for. Um, we're not a prevention tool. Okay, we'll make sure again, I wanna be as transparent as possible. We are not a prevention tool. We are, something is currently in your environment. We need to be, it's gone past your firewall. We need to be able to identify that attack and make sure that we understand what's happening and contain it within five minutes internal, 30 minutes to you. So our SLA to you, our agreement with you is five minute internal, 30 minute SLA to you. If you think about the old slide, you have over 200 days as the current uh, MTTI, we're doing this much faster. And so when you think about that, that's really what that's doing. And that's gonna be part of the detect and respond of the NIST framework. What managed risk is gonna allow us to do is be before. Is your windows open? Is your door open, right? And so it's part of the identify and, and, and the identify portion of it. Understanding what's happening and part of protecting a little bit is making sure that we understand which vulnerabilities need to be resolved quickly. Um, and vulnerabilities can be not just CVEs that are out there, but also software that's obsolete, configuration changes, um, values, uh, like timeout values, things like that. Uh, and so for us, it's, we have these two services that work in conjunction with each other, but are two separate services that work within our SOC. Now, when we start thinking about- hey, Eddie. Yeah, question? I've got a question back on the other slide. Um, someone asked if those are two different products that can be purchased separately. Yeah, there are two different services that can be um, purchased separately. All right, thanks, Eddie. Detection response and managed risk. Uh, most every one of our customers do MDR, and then they just add managed risk later. So let's say that, as an example, you're using like a Tenable or a Nexpo or a Nessus type scan. Uh, and you've already purchased it and you still have a year left. Most customers would then say, okay, I'm gonna get managed text and response, uh, which is I want to you know, protect me 24 by seven, and then a year later, two years later, um, when renewals come up, we'll go with managed risk and have it all under a single platform. So that's usually uh, the, that, uh, the, the steps that they take, or um, they just buy them together if they don't have like a, a vulnerability uh, service today. Does that answer the question, hopefully? Yes, sir, thank you. Yeah. So the number one reason why individuals will um, go into Arctic Wolf is that they actually get cybersecurity name security experts. And if Anthony can actually bring up that poll again about um, how many individuals have security experts on their staff, um, if you think about it, we have over a hundred analysts that are actually uh, monitoring uh, your environment 24 by seven. Uh, but we assign two of those individuals to your staff. Think about them as, as um, I use the analogy as they are like secret service. So you have state and local police, you have a building, they understand that environment. The governor's coming in, they come in with two secret service agents and those two secret service agents need to be able to understand your environment, where all the exits are, where all the risks are. So if something does happen and the governor is at risk, the state and local police can work with the Secret Service. These are SANS 500 level certified analysts. You get a senior engineer and you get a junior analyst that have been doing uh, SOC work for over two to three years and then the engineer for over five these two people only support between five to 10 customers, depending on the sizes. And these individuals, you'll know their phone number, their email address, how do you get access with them. And we also have a five minute emergency response. So if it's two in the morning, you call our, our, um, our 24 by seven SOC, we'll have an actual analyst that's the same level as them, work with you. And then if it's very big, they'll call your concierge security team and get them and start working on things. So they, cause they might know, they'll know the environment as, as well as you do. These cybersecurity experts are there to help you, give you recommendations, make you as secure as possible. You can call them every day, every month. There's not a limit. 
Okay, this is a service. Our job is to figure out what outcome is important to you. If you think about it, when I, want to, when I look at this, how many certified analysts do you have on staff, a lot of you said one to five. A majority, I bet, is like one to two. Think about us doubling your security staff that you actually have access to daily. And those who have zero, that's a major benefit. So now you can actually ask them questions like, hey, I'm, I'm, I am looking for a next-gen firewall. What would you recommend? Our job, we don't sell products. So they'd be like, well, maybe based on your current uh, organization and based off how many sites you have, you might want to look at Apollo Alto because they have a good a dashboard to monitor and manage all of them. Or well, maybe I only have one or two sites. Well, maybe I, you, you probably want to look at Fortinet. That's a good one. Um, it, it's, it's, it's made for those smaller environments, blah, blah, blah. Right? I'm just giving examples, not giving uh, uh, options for what people should do. But that's the kind of conversations that you're having with these cybersecurity experts. Um, they want to know your environment. They're going to be helping you with your PCI requirements. Uh, they're going to be helping you with HIPAA. Um, if you have log reports, if you have customized searching of logs, this team does it for you. It makes it easier. So your team can now worry more about being more proactive, maybe do pen testing. Maybe uh, they go into doing CIS benchmarking, which we'll go over later. But again, you get two of these individuals, which is different than what everyone else is doing. Again, this is very customizable within our environment. The way that we price and just going over at a high level is it's very simple. You find out how many users or knowledge workers you have. So you don't go in saying, well, what about uh, the construction workers? We don't count those. Just knowledge users, servers, physical and virtual, and physical sensors for each firewall. So just coming up with a sensor is, it's just a physical appliance. And if you think about it, come up with these three items, we can come up with a, a pricing that is consistent. It's not up and down. It's, it's a, we're a subscription. You can do uh, year to year, month to month, quarterly. It's a lot of ways in which we can sell the service. So do know if you're writing something down, um, how do we price it? Users, servers, and sensors. Um, hey, Eddie. It, yeah. Pardon me if you're going to get to this, but if you could talk briefly how you interact with the servers and sensors and what kind of data you specifically collect from them. I get that question a lot when I talk about you guys. Perfect. Great. So on to the next slide. <laughs> Here, um, so your so, thunder. Sorry. No, you're you're amazing. You you just like setting up uh, softballs. I love it. <laughs> so when we look at the the way that we're actually going to be getting into the environment is, or monitoring the environment is going to be three ways. The first way is we're going to have the physical sensor, which is a Linux hardened device located at your core switch, mirroring the traffic coming in from your firewall. So north and south traffic. Okay. We also, within the sensor, it's also doing a few things. It's doing all the physical logs, all the logs that are out there, sending it up into the sensor. So if that's um, your firewall logs, custom application logs, um, wireless logs, uh, DNS, AD, all those logs, it's unlimited. We don't charge you per log volume. I saw that a few of you are doing a SIM today. You probably know about the log or events per second pricing. We don't do that. We want unlimited logs because if you start to limit what you send to us, it makes it harder for us to identify threats. So we want is all the logs and it's unlimited and unlimited log sources as well. So we all that will go up into our physical sensor located on site and send it up into our SOC located in AWS West region. Also, the sensor is doing asset identification. So it's looking for new assets daily of what new devices are on the network. And also what it's doing is it's a managed IDS. So we already come with the managed IDS portion of it. So that sensor is vital of understanding things that are coming in and out of your environment, such as also attacks that happen against like printers or um, things that you can't put an agent on. Because there are technologies out there that people will say that, hey, you just gotta put an agent on everything and you're good. Well, unfortunately you can't put an agent on printers. You can't put agent on certain things those become attack vectors. I actually had a bank that became a customer uh, because they found out that a printer was used as a ransomware or a crypto locker uh, jump point. So do know it does happen. If you just do a search online, they can actually show you uh, how to have a printer create a ransomware. It's pretty interesting reads. 
The second way in which we get the information is through Arctic Wolf Agent. Our Arctic Wolf Agent is included within our service. It's unlimited agents. So we price again by users, but let's say each user has three, three laptops as an example. This agent can go on any of those devices. We don't charge you for extra devices. This, this agent works on Windows, Mac, and Linux, and its job is to identify vulnerabilities that are on the system, understanding changes that are happening. Now, you still need like an antivirus, okay? What this is doing though, is it's actually looking at more of the trust and verify methodology. So as some people might know, the trust no one, verify everything. What we wanna do is say, okay, we can't just trust what the antivirus is telling us is good. So we're gonna look at every change that's happening on a device and use the logs from your antivirus and endpoint agent to validate. Now, if there is still something that they say is good or okay, but it's doing malicious activity still, we're then gonna bring that into our sandbox environment and find out what's happening and then be able to contain it. So this agent is also used to contain where we can actually take a device and remove it off the network. So we do have host isolation and remote incident response at the endpoint as well. Hey, Eddie. Yeah. Is that an agent that goes on uh, desktops and server operating systems? Okay. Desktops, servers, laptops, all those um, that we put those on, correct. Physical and virtual. We also have the ability to connect within the cloud connectors. So if you have Office 365, that's one of the biggest attack vectors out there. Uh, we'll connect you with that. We have over 250 alerts that we have for Office 365 that we work with you on. Uh, Box, G Suite, Salesforce, uh, we work, we'll work with an Azure, AWS, and we also have integrations with like Cisco Umbrella, uh, Silence, and Okta from uh, Security as a Service. Um, so do know that the one thing about our services though, is we do not tell you what products you have to use. We're not gonna tell you you need to use like a carbon black or anything like that. You use whatever technologies you feel is necessary for your environment and we'll take those logs and we create parsers and intentions on that data. So again, we're, you tell us what technology you should have and we'll integrate with it. If there's a new technology or a custom application that you want us to monitor, there is no charge to that. Our team will work with your team to make sure that we're getting those logs in the right format so then we can create rules and intentions on that particular data. This is a very customizable service. Now, what we have here is we have the next part of it. So this was considered managed detection and response. Now, part of the left side of the other one was vulnerability scanning. Now within vulnerability scanning, we call it managed risk because vulnerability scanning is just part one of what we do because that's just actually getting the information. Most individuals are not doing continuous vulnerability scanning. It used to be you might do it once a year during a pen test and you would get this long list of things to do. I'm gonna assume that you guys, have, if anyone on this call has ever done a vulnerability scan, that you've never gone through the full list because there's just so much information, so many vulnerabilities, it's impossible to do. What we wanna do is give you a platform to allow you to document and understand those vulnerabilities and give you a priority for those. Within managed risk, you get, ex you get um, external vulnerability scanning with dark web scanning. So right now with our account risk takeover, that's including the service. So you're not having to subscribe to a dark web scanning service. We're doing that for you. It's part of managed risk. We also are have internal vulnerability assessment. Internal vulnerability assessment, this runs as a VM within your environment. And what it does is it scans every five minutes new assets that are on your network and does scans and looks for vulnerabilities that they may or may not have, authenticated or non-authenticated types. So we'll look for printers, Internet of Things, laptops, desktops, servers, anything with an IP address and a MAC address we're going to be doing scans on. Now, you have the ability to say, hey, I don't want to scan this network. Let's say you're a healthcare provider and you have um, some, uh, like a heart machine. We would want to, we would remove that uh, from there. So um, we have the ability to customize that as well. We also have our host based vulnerability, which is part of that agent. It's the same agent for both. But what this allows you to do is looking for more of 
uh, what vulnerabilities are at the OS level, um, and also helps us do benchmarking, uh, CIS benchmarking on devices on how you secure an environment. So with these three services, it comes out to look like this. It looks just like MDR from a, um, a picture perspective, but this is more of understanding again, what the risks are currently in your environment and giving your team the ability to help document it and create plans around resolving risk. Your concierge security team, those two analysts are also helping you with this. Their job is to help manage the application and the platform. All you care about is the outcome. So again, this is, even though you're deploying it, it looks like a product, we're the ones who are actually managing it. You only care about the outcome of what you'll see. And I'll show you kind of a high level of what that looks like. Any questions so far? I know it's a lot of information, but manage risk. We're going to go a little bit more deep and dive into that, but MDR from a 24 seven SOC. Nope, no questions. All right. Everyone is cybersecurity experts. Nice. All right. So CIS benchmarking is something that I think um, we need that, that some people know about, some people don't. And I think we should have actually had a question. <laughs> Anthony, like, do you know what CIS benchmarking is? It seems like about 20% uh, of the people, 25% of people really know what benchmarking is. I think it's because it is still kind of new out there and, and people have a hard time getting to the point where they can actually care about CIS benchmarking. Uh, what CIS benchmarking is, if you do a research on it, it's how you can actually secure a target system. So what are the best practices in the industry uh, for securing a particular system? As an example, let's say you're a school district and you have a student information system, the SIS uh, system, you would want to make sure that that server is as secure as possible. Um, that is where you might want to run a benchmark on. Think of a CIS benchmarking is also as in like a, um, a safe. When they're all in your environment, your job is to make your environment as, uh, as secure as possible. It looks like Ronnie had a question. Ronnie raised his hand. He learned how to. Oh, yep. Type it up in well, the Q and A uh, form, please. Yeah. Go ahead, Anthony. Exactly. I was going to say we don't have audio for attendees. So yeah, if you type it, we can um, ask it live. Look. At so you. you might move on, and then we'll we'll post it as it comes in. Okay. All right. So this is managed risk, and I'm gonna to go to where CIS benchmarking is. So within managed risk, I'm just gonna do a high level demo of kind of what managed risk is. At a high level, man, uh, this, is the, this is what the portal would look like. You have the ability to look at your current risk score, and our current risk score is based off of all of the vulnerabilities that, have been, that we have seen come up with the algorithm and a scoring system, and that's where you are. What the industry risk score is taking the last two weeks of vulnerabilities, applying it to that same scoring system, and that's what the, the industry is. So if you think about it, you want to be lower than the industry. It's kind of like you want to be uh, two people running in the woods, running from a bear. You want to be faster than your friend, right? So that's the way we kind of look at it. Now, um, when we look at the particular types of CIS benchmarking, what it is, um, we have the ability to do a scan. And from here, we would run a scan and we would give you an output, output that would look like this. So if you've ever looked at benchmarking before, um, a lot of people I've talked to, and I've talked to a guy yesterday that is part of the CIS uh, member, and it's always interesting of how hard it is to sometimes uh, document it easily or understand what those issues are. So this is a system that was scanned. And what this does is, it will, it's a pass or fail. So CIS benchmarking is either you're doing it or you're not doing it. As an example, like enforced password history is set to 24 or more passwords. Here's the reference ID for CIS, and here is the result, pass or fail. Now, if you wanted more information of why is this important, because just because you tell me to do it, why is it important? Well, when you click on this here, it will actually give you 
a deep dive into the rationale of why somebody should do this and why CIS says it's important. We also give you the, the location of where you need to change the issue or change that value. We'll tell you how we came up with the logic and we also will give you what your current value is and what the expected value is. If we look at this, it's very important that to know that you're not going to be able to do everything, but once you start looking through all of these different types of policies, you have the ability to understand why it's important. Like access this computer from the network is set to administrators and remote desktop users. You click on it, here is the rationale. Users connect to their computer, can access resources on target for which they have permission. And so it really starts to dive into it. And I think what it, what it does for a lot of people who are getting into security, it allows them to understand more about the security of the environment versus maybe what somebody else is just telling them that oh, from mouth to mouth. It allows you an easy way of doing your own research. And so if you go into leadership and they ask for it or you want to do it, you have all the information on why. So, you know, why do I want to make this change? Well, it's, it's best practice. Well, here's the reason why, because this can happen, this can happen, this can happen. That's what we're wanting to do. We want to bring this up to our customers. You don't want to run this on every single system all the time. This is something you might want to run, um, you know, off hours uh, because it is a deep scan, but its job is to quickly understand what's happening. Um, now, Ronnie said, here, I can, um, I was going to say, we had two questions, and I'm going to go ahead and launch um, the last poll while we get these questions answered. So, FYI, that's coming. But yeah, do you want to you want to read it? Do you want me to read it out loud to you? I guess you had access to see it. Um, yeah, I see it here. Uh, I'll, I'll read it. You said that there's two analysts on call with a five-minute response. What if those analysts are are with other customers? I support, I, I, I guess I'm asking how many customers do two analysts support? The two analysts support only between five and 10 customers, depending on size. So we have over 170 analysts. They only support between top five and 10. Uh, some of our MSPs do like 15, but most of your customers is only going to do about five to 10. Okay. So you, that's why we gave you two analysts. When we first came out with the service, we used to only do one. Uh, we found out that that didn't work enough because uh, there was a lot of work to do. So we assigned two analysts that work together. Those two analysts work on the same team. So it's not like me, I work for Arctic Wolf and I'm working with Anthony uh, and we're in two different locations. They actually sit in the same office next to each other. So there's a lot of communication happening. Well, and I think the other thing to, that sometimes gets overlooked is there's still a team of people that sit behind these two analysts, right? Because these two analysts have lives, they go home, they work their you know, nine to five job but there's still people that are monitoring 24 seven. Correct. Um, so yes. these are just the two that you know by name versus a big pool of typical support. And those so and think of like two support are, specialists plus the, yeah. Yeah, these two people will document all of uh, your environment. So if something does happen to you in the morning, an analyst quickly can identify it and know who to reach out to and knows the network topology just by looking at it a lot easier. If something is very complicated, they will reach out to those CSTs and uh, wake them up to say, hey, we need more information, um, this documentation. Uh, so it's very um, fluid, uh, but do know these two individuals are working um, that are going to know your environment and document. So hopefully that answers your question. Mm -hmm. If you have a, a, a follow-up, just ask that again. So the benchmark report would meet PCI requirements. Um, depends on what you there's a lot of PCI requirements. Uh, so when it comes from a scanning of understanding like vulnerability scanning, yes, we would meet it from a PCI requirements. We are not doing the, um, we're not a PCI scanning vendor. A lot of times if we're your SOC, you're going to go with a third party to do PCI scanning. Um, but um, as it relates to benchmarking, CIS, uh, vulnerability scanning, understanding changes, yes, we do meet those particular requirements. We actually help you with PCI um, reports as well. We have a part of our reporting we can do is if you have questions, we can do it. Um, Tim says, how do you price out guest networks? Users using VPN with their home PC. Um, and how do you handle smartphones? So 
within guest network, we just do it by customers, by a user. So whoever, wherever your employees are located, if you have 500, if you have 100 people that work in the office and 100 that work in this, in the field from home, we only do it from it's 200 users. Uh, we have an agent that we deploy and the agent sends out everything local to um, out their local internet. So we have that access for those endpoint agents. Think about them being at a hotel, things like that. So we're still monitoring those individuals as well. And we are monitoring them from, let's say, Office 365. So if they are using like a VPN with their home PC, you can deploy our agent on that home PC as long as they say that you can do it. Some customers don't allow it, uh, but we can do that. Uh, we also get the VPN log. So we'll be able to monitor the VPN access coming in as well. And if we know those users, we can actually put them into their own bucket. And so we work with you to customize it. Smartphones, as of today, what we use is we actually will integrate more with your MDM for providers. In the next year, we're gonna be having an MDM option, uh, mobile device management, but currently we would actually take those logs from your MDM. Now, if you think about smartphones, the funny thing is, is like, let's say you have a vulnerability in Apple. Well, the only way you could really stop the vulnerability is to just download Apple's patch and patch it. <laughs> uh, there's not really anything like extra you can do. Uh, there's some more things you can do within um, uh, like Android, but that's always been the hard part is that, you know, people really want to know who has access to it. Uh, we will be monitoring with Office 365 and VPN access in your environment uh, where they're logging in from. So if they log in with their mobile phones from Office 365 and they've just logged in from a phone in, let's say, China, that's an issue. So um, hopefully that answers your question, Tim, um, on that. Um, and it looks like when we do the external vulnerability scan, um, it looks like 50% of you do external. We have some, you know, a small, smaller, more portion is web and dark web scanning, which is pretty good, um, and internal vulnerability. Now, most people who do internal or host-based vulnerability, um, a lot of times they only do it once a month. They might do a Nessus. Our job is to really make sure that we do it continuously. And so that's something we do five devices at a time and kind of go through it over and over again. So it goes pretty well. Um, when we look at the C, back to CS benchmarking, if you see here, there is a ton of items here. Now, if you want more information on CIS benchmarking, you can actually come over here on the right side. And if you click on it, the link, it will take you to a site where you can actually download all the CIS controls. So it, this is the Center for Internet Security is something I think that everyone, you might want to look at becoming a member. I am not going to say that you have to do it or but I think most people that like CIS membership, it's something that I've talked to people and they said it's been great to do. Um, maybe get your uh, company to buy it. I think, you know, it's very, it's cheap to do if you think about it um, for what, all the information you get, but it really lets you start being ahead of the curve when it comes to security posture. Um, and again, we, we, this is all included within our, within our service offering. Um, and there are tons and tons and tons of these. So our goal is to really make sure that, you know, you understand where those risks are and just give you a way to actually work through those and then get like uh, scores over time. This is a great report to really go through with leadership and allow them to, to approve or not approve it. You know, take a couple hours, say, hey, we're gonna review our, our production system here are all of our risks. What do you think we should work on? Which, which one do we think is too big of a, a, a configuration change? And then it allows you to at least have those conversations with leadership because if something does happen, you want to be able to, you know, a good CYA of, hey, I told us about it. We couldn't do it. Don't fire me. Let's just resolve the issue. So that's what I wanted to make sure that everyone has access to and has the ability to understand. All right. So um, I didn't know, so we had this here. Now, what I wanted to do was the last part of here. So that was CIS benchmarking. And again, um, we would love to, to sit down and have a conversation with you. And with that, we 
we offer with Arctic Wolf, um, we have a, uh, there'll be a poll question here, but we do have a no cost external scan report. Over half of you say you do external scans. Um, so over the other half, if you want to, I think it'd be good for you to do an external scan if you're looking at it. Um, we come on site, uh, we discuss Arctic Wolf, we get you signed up. You do need to sign a DocuSign that's giving us permission to do it, right? We're not just gonna do it without your permission. Um, but we would do an external scan for you. It doesn't cost anything. Um, work with, we'll work with the Eagle team, just have those conversations. And, and it's good just understanding at a high level of where you are. Um, and as you see there, uh, University of Maryland this year said a hacker attack every 39 seconds. It used to be five minutes and it's gone down to 39 seconds. So um, do know that, you know, even you put out your, you put out something on the public internet, for less than five minutes, they already have access to it. They could and already could have a, uh, they said they could already have um, uh, malicious activity created to attack those devices. So um, I think it's something, if, if you would like this external scan, um, just say yes. If not, we understand. Uh, but um, every one of our customers gets this scan automatically. So do know that you get our scan once a month and uh, within our external scanning, uh, you'll get that once a month and then also uh, ad hoc scan. So if you have a PCI or not a PCI, but other types of requirements of just having monthly scans, well, PCI does too, they ask that, uh, we'll actually do that for you. So um, just do know uh, that uh, we will help you with those if you have any questions. If you would like to also uh, set up a demo, uh, a deep dive demo of MDR, how we identify an attack, how we um, escalate attack and how we do that, please reach out to the team and, 